welcome you to the Betsy and Walter Stern Policy Center here at Hudson Institute. I am John Walters, Chief Operating Officer for Hudson. I want to offer a special welcome to uh, those joining us uh, by video and audio uh, for today's presentation, which is, of course, streaming and is, will be also picked up on a variety of other uh, uh, platforms. Um, today's presentation is, of course, a most timely conversation on melting pot or civil war, our, our conversation with um, Rehan Salam on immigration in the United States. This event is part of a series of discussions on critical foreign and domestic policy issues led by Walter Russell Mead. Our special guest today, Rehan Salam, is executive editor and National Review Institute policy fellow. He is also a contributing editor of National Affairs, a member of the board of New America, and an advisor to the Energy Innovation Reform Project at the Niskanen Institute. Previously, Mr. Salam was associate editor at The Atlantic, a producer at NBC News, an editorial researcher and editor at The New York Times, a research associate at the Council on Foreign Relations, and a reporter researcher at The New Republic. Perhaps we should ask if his career has been a melting pot or civil war. <laughs> um, uh, with Ross Duthat, Mr. Salam is co-author of Grand New Party, How Conservatives Can Win the Working Class and Save the American Dream. Uh, of course, many of you already know Walter Russell Mead. For those of you who do not, he is Ravenel B. Curry Distinguished Fellow in Strategy and Statesmanship at Hudson. Uh, he is also the Global View columnist of the Wall Street Journal and the James Clark Chance Professor of Foreign Affairs and Humanities at Bard College in New York. Before joining Hudson, Walt, Hudson, Walter was a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations as Henry A. Kissinger Foreign excuse me, Henry A. Kissinger, Senior Fellow of the U.S. Foreign Policy. He is author of numerous books, including the widely recognized Special Provenance, American Foreign Policy and How It Changed the World. His next book, entitled The Ark of the Covenant, Ark of a Covenant, sorry. Um, Ark of the Covenant was already taken, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Ark, of the covenant, Ark of the Covenant, The United States, Israel, and the Fate of the Jewish People will be published in 2021. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Salam and Walter Russell. Oh, let me, before we start, let me just say copies of this book are available in the back for purchase if you'd like. And uh, um, uh, I urge you to do so because uh, however good today is, it won't capture everything that's in the book. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Great. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, just very briefly, I want to uh, talk about how special it is to me to be here at the Hudson Institute. Uh, the Hudson Institute was founded by Herman Kahn. Herman Kahn was himself a second generation American, a son of immigrants to the United States uh, from Eastern Europe. And he is also someone who devoted his entire life to thinking about the American future, and more specifically, thinking the unthinkable. It is an idea that made him an enormously controversial figure in his time, but it's also someone who made, uh, you know, it, it contributed to um, so much of our strategic conversations, so much of how we thought about how we ought to approach our place in the world during a period of great tumult and change. When I think about this moment in time, I think about the fact that we have a very large second generation population of which I'm a part. We have a very large generation of folks who are themselves the children of immigrants. We have another moment in time that is a period of great tumult and change and uncertainty. And to my mind, one of the great questions about the American future is about whether or not this second generation will be truly knitted into American society. When you think about Herman Kahn, he was born in 1922, and that's an important year. Because two years after that, 1924, you had major immigration restriction legislation in the United States. But when you think about the decades prior to that, this was a period when you had an enormous amount of immigration into the United States. Immigration that enriched our society, that contributed to its economic vitality, absolutely. But that also did create tremendous tensions and strains. This was a period of American history, we often forget, when you had a great deal of labor militancy. This was a period when anarchism and other radical political traditions really came alive in the country. 
And there was this very deep anxiety about what would happen after the end of the First World War. What happens when we open the floodgates again, when you already have a society that is rapidly urbanizing, in which the status of women was changing, in which some of the old ways of life that people had grown accustomed to were clearly being transformed. And when Herman Kahn was coming of age in the kind of subsequent decades, this was a period of consolidation in American life. That's one of the themes that I found very interesting, uh, is this idea that in our history, we've had periods of expansion and periods of consolidation. Those periods of expansion and consolidation have both been an important part of the American story. Think about the first uh, years of the 1800s in the United States. This was a time when the Napoleonic Wars were raging. This was a time when you actually had somewhat limited migration into the country, but you also had very prolific birth rates in the country. This wound up being a period of consolidation in which the idea of a new American type you know, kind of really took hold. Then you had other periods of very high levels of migration that, you know, again, created new cleavages. So I guess my big picture thought is that we have gone through a period of expansion and though expansion is enormously important, we also have to think about consolidation, particularly at a time when there is a great deal of uncertainty. We have to start thinking about the unthinkable, about how some of these class tensions and ethnic tensions in our society might unfold, and what we might do to not exacerbate them, but to start to heal them. So again, that's, that's some you know, kind of big picture thoughts, and I'm very eager to chat with, well, uh, with Walter. Great. Well, thanks, Ron. That, that is a, a good overview. One of the things I like about your work is you do take a look at this American history because I think for a lot of people, um, especially people sort of under 50, um, they've only known a country where immigration was common and open. And there's almost an assumption that it's a one-way process, that the, the higher the percentage of immigrants in the population, the more xenophobia goes down, and the more we sort of launch out into greater and greater openness, diversity, and happiness. The story that history tells is a little bit more complicated than that, and I think you, you identify that. Do you think we're seeing some of the same strains now that we saw in the early 1920s? I do believe that we are seeing some of the same strains but in some ways, the situation is even more combustible and challenging for this reason. When you're looking at the larger arc of American history, this has always been a country where you, can, to start with, you had very big families. Uh, for example, if you're looking at the 1850s, this was a time when the typical American family had you know, kind of upwards of somewhere between six and nine children. It was an extraordinary number. You're saying a lot of American soldiers went to the war to just get out of the house for a while, <laughs> get some peace and quiet. Well, and, and one of the kind of ironies there is that we often think immigration is a great way to deal with the fact that we don't have very high birth rates now. But the thing is, you know, think about this idea of securing the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. The idea of posterity has always played an incredibly important and powerful role in our political tradition. Now, when you have a situation where family sizes are shrinking and immigration represents a much larger component of population growth, well, one answer is that, aha, therefore immigration is that much more important. But it also means that it changes intergenerational politics. Mm. Because when you think about investing in future generations, it's less a matter of investing in our prosperity as we understand that in the most literal sense of our children and our grandchildren and what have you, but rather Rather, it is this feeling that, you know, gosh, you have a different population that might have different sensibilities. So when you have a lot of kind of natural increase plus inflows, then you actually have a very different kind of cultural environment. Inflows in the United States right now are not unusually large by the standards of American history. They are, however, quite large relative to family size. Mm. And that is a kind of subtle element of the discussion that I think people often misunderstand. If you believe that we need to invest in the next generation, which is disproportionately a second generation, how do you do that without having some narrative that knits the country together? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It does seem that when you, when you look back at that earlier period of, of mass immigration, um, there were a lot of forces working deliberately to homogenize, quote, to Americanize immigrants. Uh, do we have the same kinds of forces to get today? 
Well, one thing to keep in mind is, you know, again, one of the... I mean, you seem pretty American. <laughs> One of the biggest Americanizing forces is always just peer groups, right? You know, kind of, uh, you might grow up in one household, you might speak one language in your household, but so much depends on the composition of the public school you attend, right? And again, that goes right back to this question of birth rates. Because when you think about it through that lens, you know, kind of how many folks who are kind of part of this kind of multi-generational tradition are there to go around, depending on the community in which you find yourself? So, you know, think about a young person growing up in Los Angeles County right now. If you are growing up and you're a attending a school that is pretty diverse, that has you know, kind of second and third generation folks from many different backgrounds, you are going to have a really different experience subjectively than if you're living in a community where you are largely surrounded by other folks uh, you know, who are themselves immigrants and the children of immigrants from a very similar background. You know, people talk about this in the context of enclaves, and I think that this can be overstated, but I do think that that's part of the story. People often talk about the fact uh, that you know, the English language is absolutely central and important. I agree with them. That is one thing I don't actually worry about as much, because when you look at immigrants over a long enough period of time, they typically do acquire at least conversational English. And certainly, the children of immigrants acquire it. But keep in mind the background here. 1.5 billion people around the world speak English as a second language with some degree of fluency. English is an awfully valuable language to know and understand. But it happens that assimilation isn't just about language, right? You know, in a differentiated, stratified society, uh, assimilation is itself a differentiated and stratified phenomenon in which you have some folks who become fully part of the mainstream. By the way, you know, not because they're especially virtuous or what have you. I consider myself part of the mainstream. But because of circumstances, how are they incorporated into the country? What is the larger economic and cultural context? Then you have other folks who find themselves incorporated into marginalized minorities groups that don't necessarily have the same sense of buy-in to the institutions of our society. They feel excluded, and sometimes for good reason they feel excluded. And that is a kind of new and different and distinct tension that wasn't quite as present for the descendants of European immigrants in earlier eras. Yeah. Now, I think it's one of the telling points that you make is that in this earlier period, there was an immense demand from the factory system for workers and for unskilled workers. So you could get off the boat at Ellis Island without really a word of English and through a network of people who spoke your language and all end up in a factory working for the same back-breaking wage, low wages and a dirty, dangerous job as everybody else. And so that begins your economic integration. But the market for low-skill labor is not what it was. Yes, this is a very astute observation, and it's a really, really important part of the landscape. Uh, you know, so one way to think about it is that, um, in a way, the economy, the business models that you see, will bend in response to the kind of labor force you have available to you. That much is true. So you know, when you have a great deal of the availability of low-skill labor, you will have an economy that bends in that direction. But what you saw during that period of consolidation is that you pivoted to a different kind of economy, and it did have knock-on social and political consequences. So you know, again, you know, absolutely, you could put folks who didn't necessarily have a strong command of English, who didn't necessarily have uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, lots of education, you could put them to work in the factory. The idea of the assembly line was actually a way to put folks from Southern and Eastern Europe to work you know, who didn't necessarily mm -hmm. have some of those skills, some of that sophistication. The business model bent to accommodate the reality of the labor force. But then in those later decades, you had a change in which you adopted more automation. You adopted a different approach that was a somewhat higher wage economy, right? And that also helped ease some of those political tensions. I would argue that it's not a coincidence that you had anarchism and socialism as really lively political traditions during the 1900s in kind of these urban working class immigrant spaces. But then by mid-century America, you had a much more kind of conformist, solidaristic politics in which the kind of you know, goalposts of our politics became a little bit narrower. You had somewhat more of a political consensus that rejected certain modes of political radicalism. So those economic changes you describe went hand in hand with a certain kind of anxious and oftentimes very angry political and cultural climate. Yeah. Another thing that's, that's awfully interesting is that 
if you look at the you know uh, the great march of African Americans from the South into the North in the factory systems, it essentially coincides with and is dependent on immigration restriction. That is, blacks first begin to really get uh, jobs in factories during World War I when the supply of labor is cut off because of the war and there is intense factory production for wartime needs. And then after the war, when immigration restriction cuts, cuts in, um, African-Americans and also, by the way, white um, uh, Southerners move into the factory system in large numbers and this is this is a big change the they work they work with Americans that they were otherwise going to exclude because they've got to have somebody in there this is a this is a very subtle contested point i am inclined to agree with you but I guess that here's another narrative. There is this other economic narrative which says that actually uh, because of complementarity, because the fact that kind of low-scale newcomers will complement high-scale natives, you're never going to have any sort of problem of this nature. You will always have a growing economy as long as you're open to labor and what have you. And I guess the problem from my perspective with that framework is that it neglects the political and cultural dimension. To the point that Walter just raised, you know, I really do believe that actually desperation and dependence can be a really powerful force. When you feel as though you do not depend on your indigenous labor force, then you know, it means that you don't necessarily feel as though you have to make a bargain. This is an idea that some scholars call the paradox of vulnerability. The idea that you know, one of the funny ironies is that when you feel vulnerable, when you feel a sense of threat, it actually forces you to the negotiating table. When you feel invulnerable, whether you really are invulnerable or not, you don't actually develop that capacity for negotiation because you feel like you don't need to do it. So think about the fact that so many low-wage employers in the United States you know, just having had slack labor markets for such a long period of time, they find the idea of having to raise wages utterly anathema. My God, you know, why on earth would we do a thing like that? Because they've been socialized in a context where they do not need to strike those difficult bargains. And that's really a kind of cultural change. And I do think that that cultural change has big political implications. You know, the Cold War had a deep effect on the civil rights movement. You know, the fact that we as a country felt like we need to draw in allies in the developing world meant that our monstrous behavior towards this subjugated domestic minority had to change simply because it had become not just shameful, but a strategic liability for the kind of Atlanticist elite. And it really was. So when you take into account that role of kind of desperation, the fact that you really depend on legitimacy, that can really change political outcomes. Mm -hmm. um it does also seem, as I you know, read the business press and, and politics, that there's been a bit of a shift in the labor outlook long term. There, there was a fairly long period when most people in the West were saying, OK, birth rates are, dec uh, birth rates are declining. Uh, populations in many Western countries are going to be declining. Uh, we will not have enough people to do the work unless we have very high long term levels of integration. But, but that narrative is being disrupted a bit by, well, the robots are coming and they're going to take all the jobs. Because actually, it's very hard for people both to be afraid that without immigrants there won't be enough workers and to be afraid that the robots are stealing all the jobs and that we won't have jobs for anybody. You have many enormously bright, thoughtful, serious people, many of whom are technologists, many of them in Silicon Valley who are talking very seriously about the idea of a basic income, the idea that we must have payments to all folks who are members of our society, however that is defined. I'm willing to volunteer as a guinea pig, by the way. <laughs> Well, and, and one of the ideas here, it's really interesting, you know, where does this impulse come from? And I think that from some of the technologists, particularly those who have themselves been enormously fortunate in life, they really are concerned about what they see as the threat of revolution. Now, you know, again, that might be overstated. I happen to be pretty optimistic about technology and how it's likely to unfold. But I think what, you know, one thing that Walter is kind of uh, intimating here is the idea that, look, there is this weird mismatch between these kind of techno-pessimist conversations and the conversation about migration. And I guess the way that I see it is that, look, I do not know exactly how technology is likely to unfold. What I do know is that thinking the unthinkable, to get back 
back to Herman Kahn for a second, is something that we really must do. And one thing that I think of when I kind of think the unthinkable is that when you look at societies that have both intense class stratification, but also intense ethnic stratification, if you think about Southeast Asia, you think about Malaysia, Indonesia, societies where you have ethnic pogroms as a kind of constant looming threat in those societies. And then you map that on to a condition in which you know, it's quite possible that you will have, let's say it's not labor displacement. Let's say you're seeing the wages of working class folks put under more intense pressure. And those folks don't necessarily feel bought into the social contract and this kind of larger ethic of our society. You know, That's the kind of thing I consider potentially pretty darn dangerous in those earlier moments of consolidation in American history were moments when we said, look, we need to knit the country together. We need to build new institutions to see to it that we can navigate this kind of rocky and difficult period. So when I think about the immigration issue, in some ways, I'm trying to think about de-risking, you know, thinking about, look, what can we do that is going to be kind of humane and decent and in accord with our values, but that's also sensitive to this very quickly changing context? So let's shift a bit to uh, prescription. What are you suggesting that, how do you suggest the United States change our, our immigration policy? Well, in a way, my prescriptions are actually pretty darn modest. Uh, my starting point is that you've had, you know, uh, 20 plus years of efforts to strike some kind of immigration bargain between the two parties. And, and to my mind, the deep failure of these efforts is that rather than representing what I see as the real poles of disagreement in the country, they've essentially been bargains between folks who want some sort of large-scale amnesty and those who want an increase in temporary guest worker migration. And you know that is, in a sense, a kind of right-left compromise. But it's not really the right-left compromise in the country at large. Rather, it's a right-left compromise uh, between you know, kind of a, a mainstream view on the left and what is frankly a, a somewhat elite view on the right, that the kind of key issue is getting labor migration right. The key issue is stripping uh, immigrants and their children of access to the safety net. The real issue is that we need to create variegated membership in American society rather than civic, in, uh, civic equality. And that's frankly a pretty niche view. And you might be able to strike some kind of bargain there, but it's not going to be a bargain that's going to have the common assent that you really need to get. So my starting point is, you know, uh, as the Bipartisan Policy Center has kind of you know, done great work on, there is this desire for a controlled and managed system that is in the national interest. That can mean somewhat different things to different folks, but the idea that we might prioritize people who can speak conversational English, folks who are going to be able to support themselves and their families, you know, you still want to have a refugee policy, but when you're thinking about the kind of center of gravity in our immigration policy, you want it to be a skills-based point system uh, that is going to be more sustainable for the country's future. That seems to me like a reasonable compromise. That plus some sort of amnesty that then guarantees that you then have stringent enforcement going forward. That, I think, would really command broad public support, but the question is, can you get there politically? And why can't you? Well, one big thing that's happened, and this relates to an earlier point you raised about the changing economic context, is that back, uh, you know, even as recently as the 90s and 2000s, the immigration battle politically looked really, really different. Because on the pro-immigration side, you certainly had the kind of civil rights organizations, you had humanitarians and what have you, but you also had employers, and particularly you had low-wage employers who really had skin in the game. Now, however, when you have offshoring, you know, the truth is that, yeah, you still have agriculture. You know, that's certainly true. They're still in the mix, and, and they play an important role, and they have disproportionate voice, partly because of the, the role of the U.S. Senate and, you know, kind of the fact that, um, you know, the Republican Party, you have a lot of members who represent agricultural districts, but you don't have that manufacturing piece anymore. You don't have that really enormous appetite for kind of low-skill labor that you once did in the country. And so when you take those employers out of the equation, or when they're more muted, when it's not quite is important for them because you can manufacture in any number of places, but certainly in, you know, let's say the Pearl River Delta in China, something like that, it's not as urgent for you. What happens then? Well, someone else fills that vacuum. And what happens is that people who see immigration through the lens of civil rights and race and membership, people who feel as though those who want a more limited and humble immigration policy 
are actually people who want a more exclusive vision of what it means to be an American. That becomes a much bigger part of the political conversation. Because when it's really about, well, these folks want more low-wage labor, and you know, kind of maybe we feel differently about that, you can bargain. But then when you're saying that it's really about our vision for America, and these folks have a dark, dangerous, and evil vision, and we don't, we have a beautiful, humane, inclusive vision, it's much, much harder to strike bargains in that context. And that's one reason why I think that it's really important to try to reframe the conversation and think about it in a different way. How, how much do you think this talk about the uh, permanent democratic majority based on immigrants and so on, how much has that poisoned the discussion over migration, or has it really been a factor? Well, I do believe it's been a factor in a subtle way. I believe that there is a conviction among some folks on the left that there is no need to strike a bargain because ultimately the folks who kind of embrace a certain way of looking at things will vanquish the folks who don't. Uh, the idea is that there is an aging, older, shrinking America that uh, you know, happens to be on the wrong side of history and they will ultimately be displaced and they will ultimately be rendered irrelevant. You know, that's the story that you hear. And when you look to those lessons of the early 20th century, it's really striking. The restrictionist movement succeeded only insofar as they were able to garner the support of old immigrants, to the extent they were able to garner the support of second generation Americans. Uh, you know, so it's funny because you know, in mid-century America, you had people reassessing that period and, and frankly offering a pretty jaundiced eye on it. But actually, you know, the movement for restriction certainly included some awful people, some scientific racists and what have you, but there were a lot of other folks who said, well, no, I actually believe that folks of Southern and Eastern European background could absolutely be part of the American fabric. But they are going to, we're going to need time. We're going to need a project of consolidation, of integration. And that's the only way we're going to do it. But the thing is that you know, when you have those uglier voices, those more exclusive voices that kind of define the kind of narrative, then you don't get that coalition, that coalition that's really about our posterity. Mm -hmm. How will we knit in the second generation into kind of the larger American fabric in a way that's going to kind of lead to a kind of peaceful and harmonious society? That's not really a voice we hear right now, but that, I believe, is the voice that we need. Mm -hmm. How many immigrants a year should, should the United States is the right number in your mind, or how would you think about that? Well, I am going to cheat by saying that what I try to do in this book is really kind of reason from what I thought would be a workable compromise. And the truth is that I was kind of biased by the fact that I live in Brooklyn, New York. I live in an immigrant-rich neighborhood, you know, kind of like a lot of you. You know, that's the world that I'm a part of, and I've seen the really implacable resistance on kind of, you know, kind of both sides of this debate. So my starting point was, OK, how about we start with 1.1 million green cards that we issue right now every year. Let's start there, and let's talk about rebalancing. We can debate you know, kind of that number in the future, but when you look at public opinion, it is really striking. Consistently, the plurality of position is let's keep the numbers where they are. Now, that's not a very informed position most of the time. You, know, you can frame the question differently, and you'll get very different answers. But you know, that seems to be the sense and also, what you also get from folks who think of themselves as centrists, as moderates, they think, well, wait a second, to reduce that number by even one iota, to reduce it by 50,000, that would be this kind of dangerous move in this kind of awful, horrifying direction. So what I say is that, you know, kind of let's try to approach it in this very kind of sensible, sober kind of way. When you think about a point system, there will be people who say, well, isn't that kind of racist and awful? And then what I say is that, well, well actually, two thirds of folks getting green cards do it through their relatives. You have a wait list of 4.1 million people. There is no way to prioritize. There is nothing you can do as a petitioner for a green card to move up that wait list, even if you do your darndest to do all of the things that will help you flourish and succeed in American society, to help ensure that you're able to, from day one, make a large contribution. That doesn't matter. And when you think about the arbitrariness of it, I want to start from that point and then say, OK, you, you know, maybe you know, I've got to say, I do see a case for lowering the number somewhat. And I also see the case that if you have a skills-based system, perhaps you can tick them up a little bit. But I do think that that seems like a sensible starting point. Let's rebalance. And let's see that right now you have a system that is actually yielding a large number of immigrants who are over the age of 50. 
If you care about the youth of the country, then surely the fact that that's one of the kind of funny side effects of our somewhat arbitrary system, that's something you might want to address. So I kind of want to approach it in this very kind of granular tactical kind of way. Mm -hmm. So you would like to see a basically a younger and more skilled immigrant pool. Yes, I believe that if you do that with a kind of, uh, you know, kind of on an average basis, one of the funny things that happens then is that then Americans might actually become a little more open to the idea of refugee immigration. Because right now, one of the very funny things about our system is that if you enter the country as a refugee or as an asylee, you know, uh, if you're granted that status, then you're immediately eligible for various safety net benefits because of the very kind of simple reason we assume that, yeah, you are a refugee. You are someone who is in need. But one of the difficulties is that a huge number of people who enter the country not as refugees, but as relatives of US citizens, they are actually in need of those benefits that we think of as, well, it's okay if you're coming on a humanitarian basis, but if you're not coming on a humanitarian basis, gosh, you know, that's a little bit discomforting. Right, right, you're here to make a living, not here to get welfare. Exactly, and look, you know, kind of, there are all kinds of rules that say that during the first five years, you're not gonna be eligible for various programs, but you're eligible for refundable tax credits and your children are eligible. 56% of lawfully present non-citizens who've arrived over the last five years, about 56% find themselves below 250% of the federal poverty level, which is a level at which, you know, you would otherwise be eligible for a wide range of safety net benefits. Not because you're a bad person, but because the American economy has changed and we want folks to lead a decent and dignified life. Now, insofar as those folks are humanitarian migrants, you know, not a problem. And I think that a lot of people would understand and appreciate that. But to the extent that it's folks who are entering in various other ways, that is something that can be a little bit corrosive in terms of people's belief in the system and whether or not that system is working. Now, the U.S. has also, over the years, uh, varied a bit on whether, on whether it's an issue for the government where immigrants are coming from. So that um, d uh, at the period of restriction, they adopted this quota system that would give, of the total pool of immigrant slots in any one year, you had a percentage of those slots based on the percentage that your group formed in the American population, I think in 1890 yep. or something before the big wave. So this was really good for the Irish, not so good for the Greeks, et cetera. Um, and then at other times too, composition of immigrants uh, has been a feature. Immigrants from Asia were banned for, for many years and so on. Should there be, does it make sense for the United States to think in terms of origin as a, you know, either that we try to diversify as much as possible, that we focus on certain areas. How, how should we think about this? Well, my sense is that we actually already wind up doing that in a kind of funny sort of way without doing it very self-consciously, right? So if you're looking at our flows, you know, kind of this does not necessarily resemble the flows of who are the potential migrants who'd want to settle in the country. Uh, it is always a legacy of what were the past immigration streams precisely because family Just ties because were so a family. Important. Exactly. So in 1965, you know, when you were uh, crafting that legislation, you actually had restrictionists who were the ones who said that we want it to be done on a family basis because they assumed uh, that what's going to happen is that it would still in a backdoor way have that effect. You would simply mirror the existing composition of the family, uh, excuse me, of the current population. What they didn't anticipate is that for a variety of reasons, for example, the big Indo-Chinese wave that we had in the late 1970s, or you know, the Mexican influx that then was legalized you know, kind of later on, that this would wind up having quite big knock-on effects with right. the system that we have right now. Now, I guess my sense is that, um, you know, there certainly are kind of some folks who are pretty concerned about composition, but I do think that, um, you know, thinking about it in a kind of skills-first fashion is a pretty useful way to, to approach that. So, you know, a majority of folks who get permanent visas, who get green cards in the United States, are status adjusters. They are people who already reside in the United States, oftentimes on one or another non-immigrant visa. And that's something that was not really an intentional thing, because if you think about the H-1B visa, this was meant, it's meant to be a non-immigrant visa that is not a dual purpose visa. You know, meaning that it's not for folks who want to settle in the country permanently. But of course, 
a huge number of H-1Bs do want to settle in the country permanently. So there's that kind of weird dishonesty built into the system. And, and I think that some kind of point system like this, what it does is it actually makes the system less arbitrary. It makes it more predictable. It, in a way, makes it actually more humane and sane for the people who are going through this process. So I think that those concerns about composition you know, one thing that I'm concerned about is that, you know, there are a lot of folks who say that, oh, if you have a skills-based system, well, that's going to be a system that then winds up just rewarding, um, you know, let's say folks from Europe or Canada. And I've got to say, that is not my sense of it. You know, kind of when you look at the enormous global supply of people who want to reside in the United States, well, one reality is that if you're living in an already pretty affluent country, you don't necessarily have the same pent-up demand for that, right? Number one. Number two, there's an, you know, a huge increase in educational attainment around the world that is ongoing. Uh, I believe that there's an enormous number of skilled folks who come from kind of other regions. But then the other funny thing, even when you're looking at people who are coming from Europe or Canada, they are often themselves secondary migrants. They are people who come from other regions of the world who then wanted to make their way to the United States, partly because there are richer rewards as a skilled person in the United States than other market democracies. So I do believe that that is this kind of trope in the debate that I frankly think is pretty misleading. Um, and I think it kind of like takes us down a blind alley. OK, great. Well, I've had my fun asking questions. Uh, would anybody here like to ask? Now, do we have microphones? We're getting microphones, so please wait for the microphone and then introduce yourself. I would like to remind you that a question is short. It is punctuated with a question mark, and it asks for a clarification or a statement rather than itself being a statement. Yes, sir. My name is Peter Connolly. I, I wanted to ask. I wanted to ask about the asylum crisis and what impact you think that will have. I mean, I, I think it's very serious. I, I, I think I, I think that the Democrats are wrong in thinking it's not serious. I think it's a huge, huge, big deal. Are you talking about the Central American yes. caravan? What's going on right now? Okay. Uh, well, one one big picture thought I have is this: um, when you talk about these migrant flows, there is this effort to say, you know, kind of, is this driven by violence? Is this driven by legitimate concerns? Or is it driven by a desire for economic opportunity? And my own view is that both of these things are in play. Uh, you know, one way to think about it, which I find very useful, is that if you are someone who is living in a kind of violent or chaotic or impoverished place, that gives you an incentive to learn about migration opportunities. Those can be migration opportunities that are interstate, moving to another country. It can mean south-south. It can mean that I'm, you know, for example, a lot of Central American migration, you have a huge amount from Nicaragua to Costa Rica. You know, it's not something that we talk about in the United States, but it's been a very large amount over time. And also, you don't necessarily have a, that big a Nicaraguan flow to the United States versus from the Northern Triangle. Um, so, so it's all these kind of like funny things. You know, you're thinking about what are the opportunities, where are the places where I might be able to access labor market opportunities and what have you. And what you see in the case of the Northern Triangle is that, you know, yes, absolutely violence is a driver, but it's also the case that it's not just one-to-one -one where the folks who are in the most violent places or who are the most deprived are the ones who are moving. It's folks who oftentimes have social networks that also are in the United States. So I might have a relative. If I have to pay a coyote, if I have to pay a coyote $7,000, where is that money coming from? If I'm from Honduras, oftentimes it is coming from a relative who is working in the United States on an unauthorized basis. Okay? So you know, I'm moving because, yeah, I have all of these drivers that are moving me. But also, you know, I'm coming because that social network, the fact that you have that community in the United States, in a way lowers the cost of migration because you're able to access labor market opportunities and what have you. You're also able to kind of navigate you know, kind of that life of being an unauthorized person. So to me, the migrant caravan is actually a very big deal for this reason. When you take the price, the smuggler's price, let's say, from $7,000, to zero dollars, you could potentially elicit a very big migration response. When you think about Europe in 2015, that migrant wave, uh, you know the thing is that 
It was partly Syrians. It was far, partly Iraqis. There were absolutely genuine forced migrants. But you also had, according to the kind of European border authorities, a very high proportion who were coming from Morocco, from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, from a variety of other places where absolutely you have all sorts of depredations. You have all sorts of problems in those societies. But they weren't necessarily new or unique to 2015. What you saw is people responding to what they saw as a migration opportunity, right? And again, these are kind of, look, these are smart, thoughtful people. The stakes are very high for them to get information about what's going on in these various societies. So kind of my thinking is that when asylum becomes the route that makes sense for you, you will go down that route. And also, you are an intelligent, thoughtful person who will try to navigate, well, what are the things that I say and do that kind of help me navigate that kind of complicated system? Not to say that people are being insincere, or it's totally fraudulent, or what have you, but that's the pressure that you're dealing with. And that's why I do think that this is a very big deal, because I've got to tell you, that $7,000 smuggler's price is actually an invisible wall. Just as a way that a visa is a wall when you're not able to travel to the United States overland, that smuggler's price is a kind of wall that has actually shaped the folks who are making that unauthorized migrant journey. OK. Yes, up here in the front. I do believe that um, there are very good reasons uh, people are sensitive to the notion that the concerns of someone like me are kind of actually rooted in racial hatred or ethnic hatred. I think that there is a deep suspicion of folks who are saying that we need to have a controlled immigration system. Uh, oftentimes, I've talked to a lot of friends of mine who are folks who kind of take a different view on the immigration question. And then when I try to make a kind of very reasonable, measured case, I often feel like I'm kind of persuading them. But what they'll say to me always is that, but Raihan, you understand the real motivations of people who care about this. So there is this sense that there are suspect motivations at work, and that this in itself is kind of reason enough to be uh, to not want those folks to win. The idea is that I simply do not want these bad, awful people to win. Therefore, I do not want to give them any quarter. Now, the irony here is that when you act, what you actually wind up doing is you actually marginalizing. You actually wind up marginalizing people who actually are not driven by racial animus or ethnic hatred. Those folks feel like they are silenced. They kind of feel. Uh, you know, kind of like they can't be participants in the debate. And then it might actually kind of drive them to the fringes or the sense that, look, if you're not going to listen to me that way, maybe you'll listen to me this way. Uh, I really do believe that, you know, kind of those of us in this room, a lot of folks here in DC, you know, we're steeped in this world. We kind of learn the lingo. We kind of know how to articulate this or that concern in a certain kind of way. When you're looking at most folks, you know, they, they work for a living, right? I mean, they're not necessarily steeped in this world. And the way that you talk about things, you, you might sound like you're speaking very plainly. And someone else who's suspicious of you will, will kind of contort those things, right? But when you're thinking about the fact that, yeah, I mean, the, the cultural pace of change, yeah, that's a big issue, right? And the idea that, you know, kind of given that we have this more expansive safety net, you know, kind of thinking about, hey, are we allowed to actually kind of have some standards here? You, you know, it, to a certain ear, that can sound like a very ugly sentiment. But I don't think it is. And I think that if you're not taking in the views of a very large swath of the American public, you wind up leaving it to only the most extreme voices. Uh, but I will say that you know, there's this idea that, hey, this political correctness stuff is all nonsense. You know, you've got to kind of make the sharp argument and just kind of overcome it. And my problem there is that when you look at when you've had some success, when you've had some success in this idea of a moment, a period of consolidation in American history, it didn't come because you were actually further antagonizing people. It came because you offered a new unifying narrative. So that's kind of my advice to a lot of folks who are trying to think about how do we change this debate. It's that you really do need to bend over backwards to try to offer a kind of more unifying frameworks. Okay. In the back there. Uh, yes, my name is Roger Cochetti, and I wanted to ask about something you've touched on two or three times in your uh, 
in your remarks, and that is the underlying demand for U.S. residency around the world. And if this were an economic discussion, we would clearly have to say, well, how many people would like U.S. residency? And obviously, it varies from country to country. In Norway, maybe so many percentage, and in Pakistan, a different percentage. I've seen speculation that about 100 million people in East Asia, about 100 million people in South Asia, and about 100 million people in Africa would like to be U.S. residents. I've never seen any reliable data on this. I've never even seen reliable estimates on this. So my question is, have you seen any data that calibrates what the demand is for U.S. residency? I'm not even asking about the elasticity, whether it's $7,000 or $700, just what is the underlying demand? And if there isn't any data, would you be willing to speculate based on your own research on what you think the demand is? There is very there is very bad and unreliable data. The Gallup survey has done some work on this where they've yielded a number, I think it's the neighborhood of 160, 170 million. Um, but you know, frankly, that number I don't consider very useful for this reason. If you really did kind of shift the equilibrium, if we did have this kind of openness, what would inevitably happen is that you have some folks who establish communities in the United States, and then that makes migration more attractive. Because once you have an enclave, then you know, and this is the classic story of ethnic replenishment and what have you. So for example, uh, you know, the fact that you had this big movement from Nicaragua to Costa Rica, is it because people see um, you know, Costa Rica is ultimately a much better country than the United States or Canada or what have you. Well, no, it's because, you know, there's proximity and you had a large network. You had kind of large communities of folks who are in Nicaragua and who are there. So this stuff is very sensitive to context. But there's an underlying issue that you're raising. Another way to look at it is the diversity visa lottery. Countries that are eligible for the diversity visa lottery, how many people wind up applying for those visas? And it's funny because you have to have a secondary school education. You know, kind of also there are a variety of other things. You have to actually be aware that this thing exists, so you have to have some modicum of literacy simply because of that. And the numbers you see are truly staggering. I mean, you have millions of folks who apply from time to time. So, so again, you know, there are various other ways you can get some implicit sense of what the demand is. Um, but I guess, you know, kind of for me, when you think about the scale, how many people around the world, forget about the United States, are seeking opportunity, seeking a better life? The a huge number of them are going to become interstate migrants, but a lot of them are just going to be folks moving to cities. You're going to have about two and a half billion people between now and 2060. So my thinking is, look, when you have this very expansive romantic rhetoric that, you know, for example, President Obama offered about how thou shalt not oppress a stranger, the idea that we ought to be open, the thing is that that is not consonant with the fact of the matter, which is that we are not going to welcome tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions. We are not going to do that. So then how do you think about closing that opportunity deficit? And that, to my mind, there's a role for foreign policy and kind of much else. But you know, we can discuss that later on. Uh, there's a gentleman, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Kambi Bhatt. I'm with the Pakistani Spectator. And my question is how much it has to do with work ethic, because I have some Republican friend who t tell me that, you know, it's a diet issue. And I think it's substantiated by the fact that white are less than 20% of the population, but they are driving like more than 70% of the world GDP. So, uh, I mean, I'm not talking about ethic. I'm just uh, our sense of morality. I used to work for RNC, and I know some very conservative white Republican lady who would jump in bed with you in a second or third date, if not first. So it has nothing to do with sense of morality, just sense of work ethic. Do people of color have, you know, are less hardworking, or they don't have very strong sense, uh, uh, ethic, uh, sense of ethic about work? Thanks. Um, I would affirmatively reject that notion. I think that you know, kind of work ethic is distributed, you know, kind of across the population in ways that don't really correspond to color or to kind of ethnicity. I, at least I don't think so. I'm a big believer that just really the kind of economic context matters a huge amount. So you see this, for example, with child rearing practices in Scandinavia, for example. You have very permissive parenting. Uh, you know, one reason for that, one hypothesized reason for that, is that it's because you have a very egalitarian society. If you were an upper middle income Swedish parent, you do not believe that if your child falls into the working class, that will be an utter disaster for that child. Uh, similarly, if you're thinking about you know, upper middle income parenting in the United States, it is very authoritative, it is very aggressive, it is very involved, uh, partly because there is this real dread. There's this feeling that if you kind of fall out of a certain economic status. Similarly, if you're someone who's very low income, but you do not see opportunities for upward mobility, 
ability. You certainly do not see them in the kind of mainstream conventional economy. That is something that can kind of elicit all sorts of different responses. So I really don't think that it's kind of about color or background. I really do think that it's about the context in which people are received. OK. Back here. Thank you. Elliot Wolf. Um, I'd like to ask you about the melting pot, ask you about the future, ask you about what the socialization and the politics of people who have come in the last 10 or 15 or 20 years uh, illegally um, or legally, and, and whether there is still a melting pot effect. You are giving me an excuse to talk about something that I, I find pretty interesting. So you know, I, I've been trying to kind of drive home this idea that when you look at immigration, it is a really differentiated phenomenon, right? You know, it's going to be very different depending on what are the skills and resources you bring with you to the United States, and that is really determinative too of what are the kind of political and cultural pathways once people arrive in the United States. Uh, you know, uh, immigrants are not a natural kind. You know, immigrants are people. And like any other person, you know, you are profoundly shaped by your family life and, and much else, right? So if you are an immigrant who is kind of coming into an already established, you know, kind of ethnic enclave, your experience is going to be really different from if you are someone who's already finding yourself surrounded by this kind of very diverse group or kind of lots of native-born Americans and what have you, right? What you see in the United States is this kind of other really funny, tricky dimension that relates to this question of the melting pot. So there was a time in mid-century America when you could speak meaningfully of an American mainstream. This was a mainstream that was very white, typically, but it was a mainstream American culture that had an aspirational dimension. People wanted to be a part of it. It was seen as a positive thing to be part of the melting and fusing of American life. This was something that had a kind of status and prestige. You know, the whole idea was that you know, if you, your parents had grown up, your grandparents had grown up in the shtetl or something like that, and then they came to the Lower East Side and they were growing up in a tenement, you wanted to move to Levittown. You wanted to be, you know, you, maybe you were someone who was a Sicilian. You wanted to marry an Irish girl. You know, this, you wanted to be part of this big thing. Whereas when you see the cultural ethic of America right now, now, it is this much more kind of fragmented, pluralistic ethic in which you have this idea that, in a way, being countercultural, being outside of the mainstream, being at an angle to the mainstream, having a kind of meaningful, compelling grievance that gives you a kind of exciting and important story for how you make sense of your role in American life is important. I was chatting with a friend of mine who travels all over the country, talks to people about how did you overcome obstacles in your life? And, and, and what he said to me was really, really fascinating. He said that, you know, people said, hey, I had these obstacles. I grew up in this kind of family, but, you know, kind of I, I wound up doing great. And in the past, someone would have said, only in America is my story possible. Whereas now, he said, everyone says that whole story of triumph and overcoming. And they ended with, and this even happened in America, despite all of the racism and despite all of the kind of like misery and terrible things about the society. And, you know, and I don't want to be dismissive. People do have harrowing and difficult stories. This country is not perfect. You know, that's far from the case. But when you go from that first narrative, that the world is a place full of tragedy, life is hard, it's hard all over the place, but America is a country where you can overcome those obstacles and kind of you know, lead a different kind of life, a better life, versus that other narrative that somehow America is uniquely a place where we're kind of ground down by all of these forces, which to me is a, a kind of weirdly historically ignorant view. I mean, it's a view that is weirdly very parochial. Um, but when you have that view, it really does shape the cultural politics of the country. Now, I believe that there really is a mainstream in the country. You know, I'm not white, but I'm part of the mainstream, right? But the thing is that there's not prestige to the idea of being part of that mainstream. And I think that that has a kind of it's funny cultural effect. Well, exactly. I kind of ruined it, it right? But, uh, but, but I do well think that that, that kind of goes into, that goes into the bigger picture here. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, Brad Botwin, um, I think you really nicely, but unfortunately, danced around the so-called caravan issue, or caravans, plural, um, because I think it really blows up your book and your whole argument of trying to get consensus from the mainstream population. Here is, and, and I, I would even have to agree with your National Review colleague, Victor Davis Hanson, where if you're not even controlling the border, there is no incentive for the left to negotiate because these people are going to come in, whatever they're going to call it. They will 
come to Maryland. They will be in our school systems. They will be paying, uh, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, et cetera, et cetera. They're all below the poverty level. Um, how are you going to get a consensus then if you can't even stop? <laughs> They're televising it and we're watching them come up. So how does that fit with your model, uh, which is really not in reality, then if you can't do this? But just to be clear, uh, what I said is that taking the price from $7,000 to $0 could elicit a really, really big response. What I was talking about is how the European migrant wave was kind of uh, an example of this, where you kind of had the shift. Um, you know, kind of, uh, um, you know, kind of in terms of the kind of extent of enforcement and the approach to enforcement, and that led to a very chaotic migration that I would argue has had pretty big and profound effects uh, on European public life. Uh, and so I'm not discounting the seriousness of this caravan one iota. What I was trying to do is offer some context for exactly why it's so important and why we can't dismiss it, number one. Number two, uh, you know, thinking about uh, this idea that, you know, kind of the left feels like they, you know, don't have to make any compromise. Here's a really important thing to keep in mind. Right now, we are in a boomlet. The left has a thermostatic reaction because basically Donald Trump has galvanized the opposition and you have a lot of folks, you know, there's one survey, uh, David Shore of Civis Analytics uh, found a survey result saying that something like over 60% of people say that we should not deport anyone who's been in the country for over two years. That is not a real finding. The moment you have a democratic administration and you have some kind of chaos at the border, you will see a sharp response in the other direction, number one. Number two, there is a reason why so many Democrats will say simultaneously, you know, kind of, uh, people will say, how dare you accuse me of wanting open borders? All I want is no enforcement. Uh, you know, it's this kind of like very funny thing that happens. But then the other thing that happens is that you have other folks, folks who are very prominent who will say, well, we can't have enforcement because the United States in the 1980s uh, you know, was backing the Contras. That's why we, it's very, this very funny, weird kind of schizophrenic thing where people say these things that ultimately, when you bring them into mainstream politics, you are going to get a big backlash. So basically, because of the kind of anti-Trump fury, you basically are concealing the fact that mainstream opinion in the country is not in favor of this kind of extreme openness. And you actually see this time and again. The family migrant crisis, the family separation crisis, as it was dubbed, did not yield the political response that a lot of folks on the Democratic side wanted it to. Okay? It uh, certainly elicited a big media response. It was actually a serious issue of kind of administrative capacity and much what have you, but it just didn't elicit the right response. Uh, and I think that that is going to become more pronounced and more clear in the future, in my opinion. So I actually really do believe that they are going to have a strong incentive, number one. Number two, notice that Democrats do not want to talk about the tensions and contradictions. They do not want to talk about immigration because I believe they recognize that they're much better off talking about pre-existing conditions, talking about defending Obamacare, talking about expanding the safety net. However, when you talk about that, then you're creating other contradictions about what happens about eligibility and what have you. That's going to become way more pronounced in the future. So you, know, you might think that you know, the Democrats are going to be exactly the way they are right now when they're responding to Donald Trump for the next 10 years. I just don't buy it. All right, we've got uh, just a few minutes left. So let me just ask you, Hind, if you tell us how you think the immigration issue is playing out in the midterm election. You know, it's really hard to predict how it's going to unfold, but, you know, and you get different surveys. Brandon Nyan says one thing, but if Patrick Graffini did a great survey recently uh, with the voter study group. And what he found is that, yeah, you have polarized opinions on the issue, but Republicans care much more about immigration than Democrats. You know, that's just a reality. They're more inclined to vote on the issue. It is something that is far more central for them. And, uh, you know, kind of, we don't know how the news the last, you know, kind of, you know, few weeks is going to kind of shape the outcome. But I will say that there is a reason that Donald Trump and Republicans are inclined to talk about the issue. And Democrats in competitive races do not want to talk about the issue. And in fact, Democrats in competitive races in states like Arizona and what have you feel like they need to offer a kind of more muted and kind of measured take on the issue that's quite markedly different from some folks who are in the activist wing of the party. So that says to me that you know, the kind of fairly straightforward thing, Republicans will hold their ground or maybe kind of gain some ground in the Senate for all these reasons. And in the House, you know, what you see is that for 
upper middle income folks, let's say college educated folks for whom this is a symbolic issue, then you know, kind of who knows how they're going to vote. But when it becomes real for them, you might see a pretty different outcome in the future. I think that among Democrats, there's going to be a big cleavage between tax sensitive suburbanites in the party and between the kind of democratic socialist wing that really does see immigration in the context of American imperialism. So, so I think that that's going to be what we're going to see over the next kind of five years or so. All right. Well, listen, thank you so much for the conversation. Thank you Always very good much. To see you. And the books are on sale where? Over back here? And it's just possible that he might sign them. I'm not sure. Very so. happily. Okay. Great.